took the cookie from the cookie jar. Not I took the cookie from the cookie jar. And who took the cookie from the cookie jar? Number one took the cookie from the cookie jar. If you are a New Yorker of a certain age, it probably doesn't take much to get you misty-eyed over a certain group of children's street games. Stickball, stoop ball, hopscotch, maybe scully or ring alivio, or chants like, who stole the cookie from the cookie jar? Just to mention the brand names, Spaulding and Pensy Pinky is enough to turn several generations of one-time New York kids insufferably nostalgic and set them to disparaging the way kids play today. Funny thing is, according to my next guest, even other Northeast cities never developed the kind of street game culture that New York had for decades. For the last week, on our webpage, we've been asking for your memories of how you played as a kid and your observations on how children play today. You can see them at WNYC.org. Click on the soapbox. We'll read some as we go along here and take your calls as we welcome Mick Green, president of StreetPlay.com, a website that celebrates New York street play culture. Mick, welcome to WNYC. Thank you. Glad where, to be here. Where did you grow up? In Brooklyn and then in Queens. Oh, come on. You can get more specific okay, than that yeah, on the New York radio station. The Coney Island area of Brooklyn uh, until about seven years old. Then uh, Flushing, Queens, and then South Jamaica, Rochdale uh-huh. Village. And uh, you played what? All the games. Uh, stick ball, stoop ball, box ball, box baseball, which wasn't played everywhere. But box baseball. What was that? Box baseball. Three boxes. You know, sidewalk three boxes, and uh, you would pitch it in. You had to get it into the batter's box. The middle box was either an out or a a um, walk, mm-hmm. and uh, you'd pitch it in, and you'd have all kinds of curves on the small dean. You know, you'd get it to stop or to go out, and it was a fun game. And to the other out. kid had to hit it had with his palm. It, had to hit it with palm into your box um, where you couldn't catch it. If you did catch it, it was an out. If the if it if it missed the box, it was an out. And it, for each bounce at a box, it, for each time it bounced, once it bounced first in the box, it would be a single, double, triple home run. Now I grew up near Queens, and I played all the other ones you were talking about, but uh, I never heard of box baseball. So was that a Coney Island thing? I don't. I think it was a Queens thing. Oh, really? Uh, but although I've heard about some places in the Bronx too, it's funny. You know, you get different neighborhoods that had different games. There's a place in East New York that played a game called Five Box. And where you'd have to bounce a ball first in the fifth box, then in the fourth and fifth box, and the third, fourth. And uh, we didn't play that in our neighborhood. And then different names for the same games, right? Like Scully, Skelly, Skillsy, Skelsies, you know, all these different things for the, for the game with Bottle Cat. Or they were dialects. And all these things are only in New York? They didn't do this in Boston? They didn't do this in Philadelphia? They did a lot of the games in Philadelphia. Philadelphia and and some of them in Boston. Um, Philadelphia had a game instead of Skelly or Scully, they called it Dead Box, and uh, which is why we think it was originally called Scully. You can get a debate on these uh, uh, subjects, but uh, we think it was because they would paint a, a skull in the middle, and uh-huh. it was called Dead, dead Box. So in Philadelphia, they did that, and they they played some of the other games in Boston too. But it's amazing. One of the things that really surprised us was that these games were so local to New York City. We thought they were going to be all over the country, and they weren't. Huh. Uh, now, we're talking in the past tense, you notice. Mm. Are people playing these games anymore? There are people playing these games. It's much less than it was. When we grew up, it was, you know, all the neighborhoods played these games. That's what you did as a kid. You went outside, and, and this was a culture. Now you'll have it in more in lower-class neighborhoods or in ethnic neighborhoods where that have maintained, you know, consistency over the years, you know, very stable neighborhoods. And as we know, there are not many. So that's what's up. Well, we invite... Your memories of how you played as a kid in New York City or elsewhere, and uh, do your kids play in similar ways today? And do you think anything is gained or lost by the changes? Two one two two six seven WNYC two six seven nine six nine two for Mick Green, president of StreetPlay.com. I mentioned we've been collecting website postings on child's play, uh, and. Um, coming up with what some of our listeners have posted on this. A lot of our contributors did grow up outside of New York City. So, for example, one wrote, I love going into the woods and making forts in the woods behind my house in Fairfax, Virginia. All those animals I found in the woods and the creeks, turtles, caterpillars that became moths and butterflies, tadpoles into toads and frogs I found, cottontail rabbits and mushrooms to be discovered. I didn't know what shoes were in the summer. The grass was my carpet and my feet were tough. Well, your feet had to be pretty tough in uh, South Jamaica. Huh? Right, that was just like my neighborhood. That's what we used to do. Too. Yeah, yeah, flushing. We did the same thing. 
Um, how about this one? Uh, my family lived in Florida when I was growing up. We played outside all the time. Swing set, jungle gym, bikes, etc. My sister and I would drape an old rug over the jungle gym and it became a cabin or a fort for playing Daniel Boone or Cowboys. I guess that's, you know, they were outside, but um, it, it was a function of how spread out things were. Right. In New York, um, it was tremendous density. All the neighborhoods, it was just so dense. And also, inside the apartments, I think, were pretty dense, you know. But they, that's one of the changes that's happened is that a lot of the people who, you, who grew up in lower working class neighborhoods with large families where it was like go outside and play, get out of the house mm -hmm. and hang out with the different people on the street. Now, many of these people, you know, the parents, uh, their children are living in, in better circumstances in a, in a house, with maybe even a, a separate, um, most, you know, from, from they're not in apartments anymore and they, and they don't have that pressure. Let's take a phone call. Roger in Manhattan, you're on the line. Hi, I uh, just wanted to say you were wondering if people still play these games. And um, I'm 33, and I grew up playing stoop ball and single, double, triple, and I still do. And um, I also wanted to say that I, I look back uh, at learning those games, and I have no idea how I came to know them that they just seem to be in the air. Mm. Certainly my parents never taught me how to play Scully. Some kid who is just a little <laughs> older than you. I guess so. Yeah. And and um why would it die out then I wonder if if you know those same kids weren't teaching the next little kids. Well, you've reflected on your website, Mick, about why these games have uh, somewhat died out. Part of it is that people now kids are much more engaged in structured activities. You know, when we were kids, I mean, it was it was accepted. You just went outside, you hung out, and everybody was going outside and hung out. That's what they did. And now it's it's a lot more uh, when kids do go outside, they're usually in a little league or in a supervised play. Parents are much less comfortable about the kids just going outside and just being around the playgrounds. Just There's a different sense of safety and sensibility. Plus, uh, here's, here's another posting from the website where somebody speculates uh, on why technology has taken over as the new way of playing. Computer games have taken over. Also, this person writes, parents seem to be working more and home less, so there's less opportunity for children to go out. And finally, parents are more afraid to let their children out unsupervised. I think that last one is a big one. Yeah. Yeah, there was a, a real shift, I think, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, you know, playground fights that we grew up with, which were, I don't think parents felt good about them, but that was part of the accepted thing. And then you started hearing stories about people with knives in playground fights and guns. And, and that was not something that most of the people whose memories are of growing up and playing these games, you know, will recall. Now, Roger, you said you're 33 and you still play stoop ball, right? Do you have a job? Oh, he hung up. Okay, I'm just kidding. Right? Uh, Jeanette in Queens, you're on the line. Hi. I think there are two or three things uh, that started the trend uh, away from kids playing in the street. One was the, the beginning of air conditioners because parents used to come out on hot summer nights and bring their chairs with them. And then, of course, all the kids would be out playing in the street at night. Um, the other thing um, is the you know the fear i think that's a very very big one which started to grow up in the 60s and 70s uh, just being afraid to let your child out into the street and we've almost criminalized children now because police when i lived in the village in the 60s the police were already beginning to look with suspicion on any child that was just running free in the street but when i was growing up in queens we played statue which was that you swung each other around and landed in some weird position and then everyone had to guess what statue you were making hmm. and there was a lot of play uh, with boys and girls together in these games the bike riding and the jump roping it wasn't uh, always just boys playing boys games and girls playing girls games. <laughs> McGreen? There was a lot of word games. There was a lot of uh, bouncing of balls and, and singing songs along with that. Different neighborhoods. That, uh, I think this was very particular to uh, even a block. You know, certain blocks where the kids would just be hanging out together and, and playing. Uh, and traffic. I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but <laughs> traffic is the second thing that I was trying to think of before. There was really a car turning down this little street where we lived. Right, there's a lot. It was off Queens Boulevard, and and maybe right. two cars would go by in the whole afternoon on your block. So that's another thing. I think the cars have pushed the kids off the street. Right, that's true. Yeah. Thank you, thank you for your call, Jeanette. Are you still there? Yeah. Um, how did you? How did girls play with balls? 
differently from boys. Not so differently. In your recollection. Not so differently. But, I, I, but stoop ball, stick ball, I mean, those are mostly boy things. They were simulated baseball games. Well, not if you wanted to play. If you wanted to play, you just joined in. I, I, I think a lot has grown up to separate girls and boys more so than before women's liberation. I think there's been a kind of a backlash. People are actually saying that girls are weaker in school. When I was a kid, girls had better marks than boys. But you know, was, I, I think you know? that in our neighborhood, there was a, a, a strong separation in the games where the girls would play, you know, A, my name is Alice, uh -huh. and, and games <laughs> like that, which was great. Yeah. I, I do that now. Actually, yeah. I've gotten much better at that than I was <laughs> when I was uh, 11 and 12 years old. Yeah. I, I demonstrate the bouncing games. Yeah. But I think there were more word and rhyming and bouncing and, and clapping yeah. and slapping games that in, in my neighborhood mm -hmm. that the girls play. Yeah. Who stole the cookie well, from the cookie? Yeah, I, God, I, boys didn't do that that yeah. much. But I think I think boys don't know what girls do when the boys aren't around. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for calling us tonight. Great call. George in Jersey City, you're on the line. Ah, uh, yeah. I hope you didn't forget New Jersey. I, I grew up in Jersey City, New Jersey, in a white uh, uh, middle-class neighborhood. And I'm older. I'm 64, and we play games all the time. But one of the interesting games that we played... Uh, because a lot of my older cousins and some of my uncles were in the Second World War. We used to play this game called War, where we would uh, just make a huge circle with chalk in the middle of the, the street, and we'd section it up all into uh, different countries. So it was a geography uh, lesson at the same time. And then we would de declare war on one of the countries who happens to belong to one of the other kids. I'm know? afraid to find out what happened next. <laughs> <laughs> Threw the ball at them. What? Well, with a ball, right? Yeah, he threw the ball at him and hit him with the ball. The ball. Oh, like dodge? everybody, like dodgeball. No, it's more like spud. Because also. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, that was another game we used to play, yeah. and and uh, some of the games we did play with boys and girls, but definitely uh, a lot of the games were segregated. Uh, the girls usually played always, you know, um, uh, let's see, jump rope, where the boys never did, and uh, the girls would more or less play hopscotch, and the boys never did that. Uh, but something like war would be a mixed game, yep. and uh, you know, uh, some of the other, uh, as far as box balls and stuff like that, that was usually just boys. It was also interesting. People would make up games. Like you'd have different rules. I mean, neighborhoods would have their own games and different types of tags, but you would also modify the games to your situation. I I would bet most people haven't thought of this, but do you remember the imaginary runner? If you had too few kids for a game mm -hmm. and you had you were playing a game of ball, if you were playing punch ball, say so you had three kids on a side. Oh, they still do that, right? And you I, had to, I do that with my seven-year-old all the time. Imaginary runners, and the, you know, you have this whole complex thing going out, and where the boundaries are, and you know what, you know, it, you'd make up, you'd change the amount, number of bases, you know, slap ball, three bases instead of four. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your call, George. Okay, Here's thank you. Uh, uh, George on Long Island. You're on the line. Hi. Uh, I was uh, born and brought up Washington Heights, about a mile south of the George Washington Bridge. We played all of those games, three and four box, uh, single, double, triple. There was also the uh, put the penny on a crack and try and hit it with a ball. But my general observation is that... Uh, Besides other things that were mentioned, like traffic and that, I went back to the old neighborhood about three or four times in the last month, and I don't see any kids playing, including on play streets where there isn't traffic. There's nothing. There's no jump rope, no skipping ropes or anything like that, which don't take a heavy participation. And I also think Long Island is over-organized. Over-organized. Yeah. It's meaning different. sports because leagues and things like that. Everything is done with adult supervision, adults running it. Uh, God forbid two kids get into a fight, the adults get into it, and they're, they're at each other's throats within a minute. I've seen this on a couple of occasions. Instead of, let the kids work things out on their own. Well, you know, Mick Green, president of streetplay.com, he talks about Washington Heights, which is, of course, a neighborhood with a tremendous number of kids today. It's a mostly Dominican neighborhood, a uh, huge number of, of immigrant families, the most overcrowded schools in the city. So the kids are there. Are they picking up these same games? I'll bet they are playing in the streets. They're playing some of the games. I mean, some neighborhoods, we, we, I don't know with each neighborhood, by the way, yeah. and, and I'm not sure, but, you know, uh, when we're driving around, I'll, I'll see Scully being played, a Scully, in different neighborhoods. Really? I thought that one died out because That's a great kids just don't, aren't using the bottle caps anymore. They are. They are but, um, well, you still remember it was only not just bottle caps. I mean, in, in the Bronx, they were famous for uh, knocking off the bottom of the uh, chairs from the schools and using the uh, I'm not advocating this please but <laughs> the vandalism involved or checkers and stuff like that I mean you could or the bottles you know you can make a scully cap uh -huh. out of 
but um, so we're still seeing Scully. I mean, you're still seeing some of the games. I, I, I think it's very complex. Why is there such a decline in this? The, you know, the Spalding wasn't hadn't been made for a while. You know, and that that probably also contributed it to it. Um, a decline maybe in the sense of neighborhood, also as far as you know, really passing the games on generation to generation and stability. George, thank you for your call. We're talking to Mick Green, president of StreetPlay.com, a website that celebrates New York street play culture, and we're talking about children's play, past and present, with you at 212-267-WNYC, 267-9692. We'll talk to someone who grew up in Boston after we take a short break on AMA 20, WNYC. All of us can do this, touch the knee, touch the toe, clap and dance, and over we go. All of us twist, twist, can do this, this, touch his knee, knee, touch his toe, toe, clap his hand, dance, and over we go. I can see the smiles on the faces. But I remember, I haven't thought of that in 40 years. Mick Green, president of StreetPlay.com, is my guest. That's a website that celebrates New York street play culture. We're talking about children's play yesterday and today. Our phones are packed, but if you want to try to get in when people finish, 212-267-WNYC, 267-9692. I just want to go to another call. Joe in Brooklyn, you're on the line. Hi. Hi. Um, you know, I was thinking about Mick Green, first of all, great idea, brilliant idea. Um, I grew up in Boston, and, and we certainly had a few games um, that I'd never seen anywhere else. I mean, the big baseball-type game was half ball, where you cut a ball in half, and uh, it gave it properties that were unlike any, you know, you could make the thing duck and weave and turn it inside out, and it would become a German helmet, and... Um, and just two two observations. One is that it seemed to me that the the only there were a lot of uh, boy girl games when we were growing up, but but the size of the ball seemed to limit it. If it was a big ball, you could play together, punch, and the game called Polly Polly, where you throw the ball in the air and it had the famous spanking machine in you know, the hot oven. Um, but the small ball game. No, wait, wait, wait. The famous spanking machine, the hot oven. What was that? A kinky thing? Uh, well, a lot of our games, you know, uh, you, if you had the hot oven, that would be the penalty. So, uh, for instance, in Polly Polly, you would throw the ball up and say, Polly Polly, and when the ball hit the ground, everyone had to stop. And then the person who was it would grab the ball and try to hit people with it, huh. sort of like freeze tag. Um, and if you were the last person, if you could get everyone out, then you won. If you couldn't, then you went through the hot oven. And the hot oven was always everybody who played the game lined up, and you would go underneath the circle of arms like a gauntlet and get spanked by everyone. It's like under the windmill, we would call it, right? Sort of, yes, yeah. as a matter of fact. And A lot of um, games like that. One of the interesting things, and there's a number of games that were played where the penalty for losing would be either called booties up, moonies up, where the kids would <laughs> line up against the ball, a wall, and a ball would be thrown at their butt. And this was, you yeah. know, regular, like, you know, you'd get three shots or five shots, whatever Thank, um, thank you for your call, Joe. It's okay, real... Can I tell you one more thing? Yeah. It's just, I, I, one thing I have noticed, because this fascinated me, and I, I kind of looked into it uh, for a while, was because um, older people played games. Like in Boston, the, old, the older Italian guys would play numbers, you know, throw numbers. And I think that was a big thing. You know, the older people were playing games, and we mm -hmm. learned certain things, and we fabricated certain things. But that, I think, is what's key, is really missing now. Is older people aren't playing games, and younger people, since they model themselves after that, huh. aren't seeing it, and thusly they, they don't emulate it, and it's, it's lo the culture is losing it. I Interesting. Believe. Interesting. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Joe. Thanks a lot. Uh, McQueen, he has some games that you never heard of. That's, well, that's right. You see, I have to write to them. Uh, Joe, please uh, go to the website and definitely put in what the, a little more detail about those so we can have them. That's at streetplay.com. Esther, who grew up in the Bronx, you're on the line. Thank you very much. I'm almost 80 years old, and when I go back in time to think about what we did, we had wooden cheese boxes. We used to make little holes in the front and write a number over it. Whoever wanted to roll a marble over to it, and whatever hole it went into, that's how many marbles you won. We used to flip baseball cards, and I had two shoe boxes full, which 30 years ago I threw away. I said, what are they laying around for? Thousands now, of dollars. Now, this yeah. is an interesting thing, the baseball cards. And, and we talk about the changes. Now, think about this. Uh, my kids um, have Pokemon cards and uh -huh. baseball cards and mm -hmm. stuff, which they don't flip. They don't, they don't do all the games. We had like four or five different types of games where you would 
compete and win the baseball cards. All the kids do now with the cards are collect the cards. That's right. Now, can you imagine they boys don't flip and girls? Today. They don't flip today. They collect. on a pony with each other? No. Well, that would be too dangerous, right? People would be Not very uncomfortable. We were so naive where you had to put your head between the other person's legs and they would jump on us. And this was boys and girls mm. together. Mm -hmm. Can you picture that one? It, well, uh, that was an enjoyed co-editivity there. Yeah. Right? Esther, thank you for your call. Now, of course, these things weren't uh, the stuff of fond memories for everybody. Someone posted on our website. I was unbelievably coordinate, uncoordinated when it came to sports, plus didn't like getting yelled at by some 10-year-old Mickey Mantle wannabe when I made a bad play, so sports was out. If you ever show, saw the show Freaks and Geeks, that was my life in a nutshell. Huh? And there were definitely yeah. the in-kids and the out-kids in all of this. There always is. That's part of the difficulties of growing up. We idolize it and think of it as just being wonderful, but there are also some traumas that we all go through. Stan in White Plains, you're on the line. Yeah, hi. Um, I've uh, this brings back just great memories, and I have gone to your website and enjoyed it very much. Thank you. I was wondering about a couple of games that are not actually ball games or anything like that, but we used to play a card game called Nux. Oh yeah. You know that. Yes. Right? Yeah. yeah. Which was which was you know, and actually that got a little bit violent, not terribly. Well, you like lose, you get wrapped on the knuckles with the right, deck of cards right. in yeah. some really creative and you know painful ways. Yeah. You? <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. There was another one that we used to play, and it was called Two for Flinching. Do you, that? Do you know if that? If you would, you could get punched. Right. But if, if you didn't flinch, it, you wouldn't get really punched. But if you flinched, you got two shots. Right. Yeah, I mean, they weren't organized <laughs> games, but that's what kids did around the school in junior high. And the third one, which you hadn't mentioned, which was very popular, was a, a, a war game called Land, which you made a, a, a square in the dirt, and you threw a knife into the dirt, and you divided it up as... Is this as Mumbly Peg? Nice land, la, nice landed. Right. Mumbly Peg? Yeah, yeah, well, that, yeah, I guess that was the name before we called it Land. Right. Yeah. The other thing was there were two types of kick to can that we played in the Bronx. This was in the Yankee Stadium where I grew up. One was where you actually kicked the can and you ran bases, but the other one was the kick the can version of, of uh, hide and go seek. Right. Where you right. kick the can and then the person had to run and bring the can back to the spot and look for people. Right. Which was interesting. And, and the last thing that, I wanted That to was mention, played, by the way, that game was played in many places. That's uh, one of the games where I've heard about in rural areas as well. Kick oh, the can uh, seems to have been a problem. One last thing I wanted to mention, which wasn't a game, but something we used to do in the Bronx, and I'm talking about 11 or 12-year-old kids in a lower middle-class neighborhood. That was pretty safe. Parents used to go outside. But we used to do this. Cars would ride up the street. It wasn't a busy street, but it was an average street. And kids would stand on either side of the street when it, as, as, dusk, as, as it was getting dark. And you'd pretend you were holding a rope so they could see you the cars would come up, and you see the cars come and slow up because they couldn't see the rope, but they saw the kids holding this rope, which was imaginary. And the car would stop, and then, of course, all the kids would laugh and run away, and then the next car would come, and we would do the same thing again. Now, that's a better version. I just heard one of the things that when we talk about um, why we now have so much more supervised play, I can understand as a parent. I mean, I, I recently heard stories about kids, you know, lying down in the middle of the street, playing chicken with the cars, right? Can you imagine, you know, lying down in the middle of the street, great. Right. Or yeah. hitching the back of a car. So you they know. do that punch thing now with guns. <laughs> that great call. Thank you very much, Dan. One more. Evelyn in Manhattan. You're on the line. Yes, thank you uh, for having this program. It is so nostalgic. I grew up in the Bronx around Marshall and Parkway, and we were very creative. None of us had money. We were all poor, so you really couldn't afford any toys. And we were sharing everything. Hmm. One, one friend would have a rope. One would have jacks. One would have cards, and when we went outside, we were like a, a gang of kids, boys and girls. When I say gang, I mean it in a nice way. And we shared everything. We were very inventive. We would take a sheet from the house, hang it over two trees, and tell the, the uh, people in the neighborhood we were having a play and charge a penny for everybody to come. And if you couldn't afford, you could come anyway. Uh, Evel we, we Evelyn, I have to leave it there because we're out of time, but okay. thank you very much. Thank uh, well, Mick Green, do you think we romanticize the old days of street games or think of them as safer or more carefree or even more creative than they were compared to today? They're definitely more creative. They were wonderful. I mean, I was just thinking in the last caller as she was speaking about how when you don't have as much, you tend to use what you do have in a much more creative manner. So um, that's what we hear time and time again. Uh, safer, they were much less safe than we remember. And when we actually stop and think about it, um, they were, they were, part of the reason, again, that adults are so concerned about supervision is because of the safety issue, and, and there's, there's merit to that. Well, on 
Mick Green's very fun website, streetplay.com, which even though it's a .com, he admitted to me this is uh, a hobby for him. This is not a business. Uh, he's not making money on this. He has a day job. Um, he's got uh, pages like Jumping with the Divas, video coverage of the Double Dutch Divas, the Street Play Galleries, uh, featuring now the work of photographer Karen Bell uh, with um, uh, you know photos of, of these old things, page called Handball Madness, all kinds of other stuff. And it's been great talking about the old games and uh, the new ways of doing things, too. Mick, thanks so much. Thank you very much. And remember, you can also continue to post your stories and read the ones that others have put up about child's play when you were kids and comparing it to today's at our website. Go to WNYC.org and click on The Soapbox. And that's it for today's On the Line. It was 10 years ago this week that Iraq invaded Kuwait. Now another showdown over weapons inspections may be on the way. Tomorrow we'll look at how a fall standoff might affect the presidential race and what kind of Iraqi policy is right for today. On the Line is produced by Marianne Carlson with assistant producers Elena McCather and Nula McGovern. We had help today from David Wegener. I'm Brian Lehrer on WNYC AMA 20 New York. It's noon. Here's Leonard Lopate.